All right, all right. Good morning, good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to Forge, where we are building great men. As God defines greatness, if you can grab your seats, that'll be good. If we have any guys here for the first time, if you're here for the first time, if you would, just do us a favor and stand up right where you are and um, let us know your name and how you heard about Ford. So if you're here for the first time, if you would just stand, let us know who you are. Yes, sir. Hey, Keith. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for being with us. All right, thanks for being with us. Anybody else? All right. Well, if you're on social media, you can go ahead and you can check in, um, let your friends know that you're here. You can also share the live stream and let them jump right on there and they can actually hear the message that will be spoken this morning. If you haven't gone to FordTruth.com and signed up for our e-blast, you can do that as well. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll get Dr. Pete up here. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have given us, Lord God. Thank you for waking us up and allowing us to breathe today, Lord. We give you thanks for that, Lord God. I thank you for every guy that is here, for all of those that will join us online, Lord God. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill this place, that you would fill our hearts and our ears, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your sons, Lord God. Build us up for your glory, for your honor, and your name's sake. In Jesus' name, and everyone, man, every man said, amen. amen. Come on, come on back here. Okay. Hey, listen, guys, um, 20 years ago, Bishop Quinones started a church that he still serves and is celebrating the 20th anniversary of your leadership. <laughs> Thank you. I love you. I love you. I'm proud of you. And... Uh, Notice his hairstyle. That's what the ministry does to you. Either that or this. Uh, there it is. But uh, uh, Bishop, Bishop, thanks. Hey, guys, good to have you here this morning. Glad you all made it. And uh, especially those who are with us for the first time, it's good to have you guys here. We hope you don't, we don't run you off around your table. And uh, the guys who brought you get a commission for bringing you, I want you to know, uh, in heaven, in heaven. Uh, that's where the commission uh, comes due. But it's good to have all of you guys. It's good to have Do Dr. Dan Lasich back from Oxford and studying overseas. Good to have you back. Um, hopefully, you'll make me a whole lot smarter now from all that you've done over the summer. But good to have. It's, he doesn't have that much time. That's, yeah. If you're new to Forge, we speak the male love language of shame and abuse. And I just got it right there. Guys, I'm so glad you're here. Today is a big day, and uh, not only do we start a new series, but it's voting day, right? You're all going to vote, and uh, as somebody said uh, uh, to me on the way in, Tim said it on the way in, he's been voting early and often all week, so I'm glad uh, that he's been doing that. Um, if you need to know who to vote for, come and ask me. I've got uh, the, the proper list down in my book here. Um, sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong, but I'm never not confident. Uh, so there it is. And uh, we're starting a new series today called Forge Seminary. Forge Seminary. Here it is. And this is the picture. Uh, I, I, I love what our producer has done for us because this picture is probably the best picture of a seminary, as you'll see as I put it into perspective, uh, that, that we could really, really have. Notice I said the name of the series for the next six weeks is Forge Seminary, not what? Not Cemetery. Uh, a cemetery is where you bury the dead. A, a, a seminary is where the living come to life. That's what a seminary is or ought to be. Uh, the word seminary uh, was not really uh, used much before uh, Anno Domini in the year of our Lord, 1400. So after 1400, uh, they started talking about seminaries. And the idea of a seminary is a seed plot, is a nurturing environment where that which uh, is alive can grow and grow up. In time, the idea of seminary became known as that place where we train 
ministers for the gospel ministry, for the vocational ministry. And so probably when you think of uh, seminary, you think, well, that's for ministers or guys that want to do vocational ministry. How many of you have thought of seminaries in that way? That's where ministers get trained. How many never thought that? How many could care less? I mean, but the bottom line is seminary is really, really important. And we're going to be talking about uh, what does it mean that Jesus is going to develop us as his men. That's what we're about at Forge, by the way, right? Forge is about building great men as God defines greatness. It starts when a man bows the knee before Jesus Christ and accepts him as Lord and Savior. And at that time, the process of development begins and continues. And, and we follow Jesus like the disciples did. This is seminary. Sitting with Jesus, thinking about God's thoughts deeply, God's truth deeply, and learning the implications of biblical truth and how it applies to our life and transforms us. I mean, the bottom line is, uh, are, are there more, uh, any better pictures of 12 ordinary men that have been used to transform the world than the disciples? Uh, no. And they were in the seminary of Jesus, and he taught them. And so we're going to be talking about that as we go. Seminary, not cemetery. Now, one of the consequences, real quick, of this whole idea of ordained ministers. Now, I'm going to ask, I'm going to, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, tr this is a potentially tricky question here. So think before you answer. Is the ordination of ministers to the gospel ministry, is it a biblical concept? The answer is yes, it is. Timothy was ordained by the presbytery, by the laying on of hands of the other elders. That's what the presbytery is. Presbuteros simply means elder. And so the elders in his area laid hands on young Timothy and set him apart for the gospel ministry. So the idea of ordination is a biblical idea, but this idea that there are some that are more holy than others in doing ministry, and therefore you guys are the hoi polloi, you're not really that important because you're not ordained. <laughs> uh, my, uh, my mentor, Steve Brown, when we do radio programs together, he will say oftentimes, because this is one of his favorite lines, he'll say, hey, don't try this at home. You're not ordained. Pete and I are. And, and he's really tongue-in-cheek on that because he's, he's, making, he's making light and making fun of the reality that down through church history, there's been a problem created by this idea of ordained ministers. It's created a laity-clergy gap in which we who are ordained are six feet above contradiction. We who are ordained and have a special ordination speak more powerfully and have the grace of God. Whereas you guys, you don't. I mean, you don't have the Holy Spirit as much as we do. Listen, um, due to inflation, I'm going to raise my numbers here, but if I had 10 bucks for every time somebody came to me at the end of a service and said, Pete, would you pray for me? because you're ordained, God listens to you more. If I had 10 bucks for every time that was said to me, and I'd be driving a Porsche right now, I want you to know. Because this idea is pervasive of a, of a laity clergy gap. You're the people, we're the clergy. We have an ordination that is superior to your ordination, and that's not act, actually accurate. We have a different calling for, to make this vocational. But all of us, biblically speaking, are believer priests. And all of us have an ordination from God. All of us, if you're a Christian, you've accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, you are a minister, a messenger, and a manager of the time, treasures, and talents that God has given you. You're ordained. You're ordained to the gospel ministry. And if the ministry is limited to just those who are ordained to do this vocationally, we're in trouble. 
we're, we're really in trouble. Uh, and that, that clergy lady gap has, has led to so many problems. Those who are ordained are to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that we can go all go out and minister. You get that, guys? That's why we're... See, I've always thought of Forge as a seminary. Seminary for men. A seed ground where we all grow. And, and take up our rightful heirs as ministers, messengers, and managers of your time, treasures, and talents. Memorize that, and you can go right to heaven, I want you to know. Um, kidding, kidding, kidding. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about seminary. I've been to seminary, and I want you to note that seminary can become cemetery if you're not careful. Why? Because, because what goes on in seminary often is the intellectual rationalization of God thoughts and biblical thoughts that are so deep and, and, and that guys, humanity loves to dry things out. And so seminary can become a time where you're learning a lot of academic things. Today, seminary, you take Greek and Hebrew, right? How many people do you know that speak Greek and Hebrew? The Greek of the New Testament is no longer the Greek that they speak today. The Hebrew of the Old Testament is no longer the Hebrew that the Hebrews, Jews, are speaking today. So the reality is we learned two dead languages in seminary. And before us, they used to teach Latin, another dead language. So, you know, the reality is seminary can dry you out uh, and the problem is, in America, is that seminaries have been influenced by the secular academic institutions in America. Let me ask you a quick question, see if you know the answer to this. Who started the university system in the world? Who was it that started the university system in the world? Christians. Education was started by Christians. Where? Not here in America. It was in the, in the, in the what, Dan, 1100, 1200, I don't know, right around there uh, in, in, in Europe. And educational systems were started by the church to do what? Train ministers, and that led to the expansion of all education. A Christian understanding of the different disciplines of life. And so, and so Christians have always been at the forefront of education. The problem is, is that our seminaries in America since uh, the late 1800s have been influenced by, by secular rationalism, secularism, materialism, atheism, and Marxism. And it's pervaded our systems. And so our seminaries today, you got to be careful. If you, gotta, if you want to go to seminary, talk to me. I'll tell you which ones to stay away from. Hey, uh, Harvard was started as a ministerial training center. And, and because it went liberal way back, they started Yale. And then Yale went liberal, and so then they started Princeton. And then Princeton has struggled with it too. So really, you see, the, the problem is, is it's even the sem seminaries can become cemeteries when academic, secular, rationalistic thinking gets into uh, into Christians thinking about truth. Now, let me say something else, okay? I got in trouble with this the other day. I'm going to say it again. Somebody sent me an email. Don't mean to send me an email about this. I got, a tr I got in trouble about this. I am not saying that there aren't some Christian academics out there that are very good in the secular world. But I will say this. Almost every one of our social problems comes from the academy, from the from the university systems in America. Where, where do all those bad ideas in our culture come from? They come from academics. They come from academics who have put God on the shelf and are thinking through secularized, materialistic eyes, Marxist eyes, and, and teaching our youth. So really the bad ideas in America, who trains our politicians? the elite institutions. How many good universities are there where you can go and get a good biblically-based uh, training? Ah, maybe 15. Really? It's that pervasive? Yes, it is. And so we face a day and age, uh, and, and I'm going to get an email about that from one uh, Forge listener. And I love you, brother, but uh, you just... Listen, my, why, why in 
as many years as I've been a minister, why is it that I have witnessed so many of our kids who grew up in the church I served, who then went to university and within a year or two abandoned their faith? Why have I seen that pervasively? Well, it's, it's because it starts, uh, it starts in the secular level training teachers and it's gotten all the way down into our school systems today. And you have to be very careful if you have young kids where you put your kids in school. You could hear a nasal drip in here right now. There are good academics who are Christian out there in the secular world. Dr. Alan Fickett's one of them. Jay Bennett's another one. We thank you. Uh, but the reality is they're few and far between because we have experienced the frog in the kettle thing. You know the frog in the kettle? Put the frog in the kettle, turn it up slowly, and the heat will boil the frog. I've never actually tried this. I was thinking about it. I really would like to try it. I love the analogy. My, my granddaughters wouldn't like me doing it, but my grandsons would, I think, and I, I'm probably going to do it someday. If I can get Wyatt to do that with me, I'm going I'm to do that, but um, the the reality is, is that's what's happened here in America. So the reality is, is that, um, is that we have a watered down educational system that used to be based on a Judeo-Christian foundation, and that is gone. It's not so much what they put into education, it's what they've taken out of education that has made all the difference in the world. And it's affected our seminaries. I love this Dennis the Menace uh, uh, cartoon. Uh, Dennis the Menace, I miss Dennis the Menace. He's in church, they're passing the plate. Can we get a refund if the sermon isn't that good? <laughs> you know, Pastors, uh, um, I, I, I think it's a supreme, a supreme evil to bore our people with God's truth because God's truth is not boring. It's life-giving and energizing. It's seminary. It feeds us and grows us. That's what the gospel does. Builds men. All right, you ready to do some work? Get your Bibles, open them up. I have it up here, but if you have your Bibles, turn uh, to 1 Timothy, because I want to walk through a bunch of verses with you, and then you got some outlines, and then I'm going to nail this out, and you can talk about it around your table. You ready to do some work? Okay, here we go. 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 7, as we talk about the importance of teaching and truth. The Apostle Paul starts out, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true son or child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I love that. Uh, by the way, once we get grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, he gives that to us every day, right? You get it one time, but you get it every day. The gospel keeps on giving and then Paul says to Timothy, just as I urge you upon my departure for Macedonia, that's northern Greece, uh, I urge you to remain on at Ephesus in Asia Minor so that you would instruct certain people not to, what's that word? Teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to endless speculation rather than the advance, the plan of God, which is by faith. So I urge you now. So Paul, uh, Paul was the church planter of the church in Ephesus. He started it, and then he left it. He put Timothy in charge of the church of Ephesus to go deeper, teaching the elders and deacons to be, and teaching the people. Uh, and uh, later, John the Apostle came to Ephesus and led that church that Paul started. But the bottom line is that... Uh, uh, Timothy had to stay on. When you get a new church, you, gotta, you, gotta, you got new Christians, what do you got to do? You got to teach them. Because when we come to faith in Christ, we are babies in Christ. We know how to get saved. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation. There you go. But then what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, you got to teach them. And so Timothy was to say and to teach true doctrines, truth about what it means to follow Jesus and who God really is, teach the truth, and also a pastor is supposed to teach 
uh, people and instruct them not to teach strange doctrines. Now, strange doctrines means something other than the gospel. He's not saying, well, that's a weird belief. Are there a lot of weird beliefs out there, guys? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, you just go to a lot of different churches. I, you know, I think, Whoa, really? The question is, is it biblical? The, the question is, is, is what, what is being taught? Does it square with what the Bible teaches? Because the Bible is truth, right? Yes. And so the question, uh, the, the, and, and the Bible was not put together in Timothy's time, so they had all these individual parchments and doctrine, doc, documents, uh, but, but the bottom line is he had to teach strange doctrines, not to pay attention to myths. Are there a lot of myths out there today? Yeah, a lot of those myths come out of the academy. A lot of those myths come with people who have PhDs, like gender is fluid. Really? That's a myth. There's no, there's, no his, there's no scientific evidence about that. Like killing babies is okay. It's a myth. It's a lie. We'll see where it comes from in a minute. Uh, endless genealogy, useless speculation, rather than the advance of God. Then he says in verse 5, the goal of our instruction, the word could be translated command, the goal of our command. See, Paul is saying what we teach are the commands of God. What a pastor ought to be teaching are the commands of God. What I ought to be teaching you are the commands of God, not my own ideas. You ought to walk out of here and say, well, that seemed to square with the Bible. Not, wow, that's a new thing I never heard before. If I tell you something completely new that doesn't square with any of the commentators that have written down through church, if I'm telling you something and nobody else has taught it in all of church history, run out of here and say, heresy, heresy, heresy. Now, maybe it's the first time you heard it. Check around. Is Pete being a heretic here, or is that in the Bible? But the bottom line is, we're not here to innovate on the gospel. We're here to explain what the Bible teaches, right? That's what we ought to be doing. Uh, I urge you now, uh, the goal of our instruction, the goal of our command is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some people have strayed from these things. And Paul is writing to Timothy, this is first century, guys. This is about 30 years after the resurrection, and the church has already developed, and people are straying away from the truth already. That's how early the move away from sound doctrine started. Um, and so that's why Paul says, you, you got it. He says, some people have strayed from these things. They've turned aside to fruitless discussion. Um, in other words, they're not really saying anything important. They want to be teachers of the law, even though they do not, I love this, even though they do not understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. I've heard that. Oh, when I served a church in Connecticut, I went up to Yale Divinity School and sat in a ministerial conference, and I sat there, I brought my Bible, and I heard them, uh, I'll never forget it, teaching on Jephthah's daughter in the Old Testament. It was the, it was, it was, the most wacko exegesis of the Old Testament. It was eisegesis. He was looking in. This is Ford Seminary. I'm giving you new words. He wasn't reading out of Scripture. He was reading into Scripture from secular thinking. And I walked out of there thinking, oh my goodness, this is why New England <laughs> is in such turmoil because of this kind of stuff. Now look at this, 1 Timothy 3, real quick. It's a trustworthy statement, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. An overseer, overseer and elder, this is Ford Seminary, right? The word overseer is the Greek word episkopos. You ever heard of episkopos? Episcopal form of government. Uh, it could also be translated bishop. Why do we call Bishop, a bishop, because he's the overseer of the church. A synonym to that is elder. Elder and episkopos, or elder and overseer, they're synonyms. So uh, is he a bishop over a whole region? No, he's a senior pastor of his church. That's entirely consistent with uh, what elders do. They oversee the church. And vocational pastors do that full time. An overseer then he gives the qualifications. He must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. 
Dan, you only have one wife, right? Just currently, okay. <laughs> Must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. Literally, this, this could be translated a one woman man. It does deal with the idea of poly, multiple marriages, but it really deals with the idea that a minister, as and this is hard because I'm a guy. Um, we all need to have a heart that is focused on our wives, even though we are often distracted. Um, an overseer, above reproach, husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospital, skillful in teaching. Why should an elder in a church be skillful in teaching? Because teaching has to take place. Truth has to be explained. You can't build your life on lies. Well, you can, but you will fall apart. Notice, notice what he says down there uh, as he goes on. Not overindulging in wine, not a bully. Have you ever met a bully? As a pa- I, I believe in strong leadership, but I don't believe that elders should be bullies. Pastors should not be bullied. Gentle, but not pushovers, not contentious, free from the love of money. One he should be one who manages his own household well. But why? Well, the thinking is this. If you can't manage your own household well, how can you lead the church? The church is a family. A pastor has to have his household in order. His marriage with his wife, his kids uh, has to be in order. So, and not a new convert. I believe in, we need young elders, but uh, not too young got to have some life experience to lead the church as an elder. It goes on and on. There's a whole lot we need to to look at, but real quick, and then I want to sum up, because I want you to talk about this around your table. Look at the next text, 1 Timothy 4. The the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Paying attention to, what is it? Deceitful spirits and doctrines of what, guys? Demons. What you need to understand is that Paul wrote this again about 30 years after the resurrection, Max. And already there was false doctrine attacking the church and people falling away from the faith. Do not be surprised when people fall away from the faith. Don't be shocked. Don't say, I can't believe it. It happens. It's always happened in the history of the church. Maybe their faith was not real to begin with. That's my belief. John says they went out from us, but they went out from us because they were never really of us. And I believe if you're really saved, you're going to stay saved. There's a lot of people that get brought into the church uh, sociologically, relationally, but they're not born again. Can you fake like you're a Christian? Can you carry the right Bible? Can you learn the lingo? Of course, we're men. We figure out subcultures all the time. You let me, you, you, you put a suit and tie on me and walk me into the corporate boardroom and give me about 15 minutes and I'll figure out what I should say and what I shouldn't say. It doesn't take long. They do that in the church as well. That's why there has to be teaching, discussion. Why do we have table talk? so that we can say, what did he say? What does he mean? How does this apply? we got to think it through. we got to go to seminary. we got to sit with Jesus. we got to work this stuff through so we get it into our lives. Church is not going and hearing a message and walking out. It's allowing the gospel to transform us. Now, I could go on, but I want to get to your outline real quick. I'm already going to be over, but it's going to be a couple more minutes real quick. Let me do some terms, definitions, When we did that study on the end times, I didn't give you enough definitions to begin with, so now I'm going to give you some definitions, and then then you can talk about it around your table. What is doctrine and theology? Definitions are crucial. Doctrine comes from the Greek word, and you don't have to, you can impress your friends if you want, or didaskalos. It's a simple word, didaskalos. It's found 25 times at least in the New Testament in various forms, more uh, times than that. Didaskalos simply means teaching. Doctrine simply means teaching, okay? All right, let me ask you this. What what does doctrine mean? It means teaching. So when somebody says to you at church, 
Um, listen, don't, don't give me any doctrine. Just tell me about Jesus. You say to them something like this. You say, what are you smoking? You don't know what you're talking about. I can't, I can't tell you anything about Jesus unless I give you some teaching about Jesus, which is doctrine. Do not play that game. You're in seminary. Change the situation. Don't, too many Christians, I, don't give me doctrine, just give me Jesus. Really? I can only give you Jesus if I tell you some teaching, some truth about Jesus. That's doctrine. That's all it means. Don't, don't overcomplicate things. Predestination is a biblical word. Don't be afraid of predestination. Hell is a biblical word. Do not be afraid of the word hell. Um, doctrine is a biblical word. Do not be afraid of the word doctrine, okay? Have some confidence in that. Uh, theology is simply, what does theology mean? It means the study of God, the words about God. Theos is the Greek word which means God, right? Theology is just the study of the God. Are you a study of God? Are you a theologian? Of course you are. Of course you are. Every man following Jesus Christ is a theologian. Do you study about God? You go to church? Do you read your Bible? Yes. Say yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Worry me a little bit. Um, you're a theologian. The question is not, are you a theologian? The question is, will you be a good theologian? Will you be a biblical theologian? Will you get into the Word of God and study it deeply, or, or will you let your emotions run? The, will you let secularism interpret the Bible, or will you let the Bible interpret secularism? We're, we're all theologians, and I believe you guys can become incredible theologians. Well, okay, so what is systematic theology? I love that, systematic theology. This you can impress somebody today with. Somebody who loves Jesus, you say, yeah, we, we talk about systematic theology today. Really? You tell, I'm a theologian. Systematic theology is simply taking Genesis to Revelation and saying, what are all the major doctrines? And, and how do we understand all of the major doctrines in a systematic way? Because as Wayne Grudem says, there's, there's a difference between systematic theology and disorganized theology. Most Christians have what kind of theology? Disorganized. They don't have the major categories. And they think that we who are ordained have all the categories and therefore have the special secrets, the Gnosticism. That's why I'm going to expose all that and let you have it. So you can hold your pastors accountable. You say, what? Yeah. You know, in the older churches, the elders used to all sit in the front row. How about that, sports fans? The pastor gets up there, and he's got these big old gnarly elders sitting there, about 10 of them. Why? Because the first audience in a sermon were my elders. And if it couldn't pass their muster, it shouldn't be good for the people. Now, they didn't do it in my church. I wouldn't let them do that. But I was always accountable to the elders' teaching. And not one word of my mouth came out that wasn't subject to them. And they had the right to hold me accountable. Did you say... Um, Systematic theology is understanding all the major doctrines of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, biblical theology. See, like it knocks, the, the easy understanding of that is to say, well, let's take it in, in chunks. There's Old Testament theology, there's New Testament theology. There's the theology of Moses, there's the theology of Paul, the theology of John. My favorite, and we can go into this more, but my favorite is systematic theology. I want to know what the Bible says on every major subject and how it all fits together because I want to have organized theology, not, not, uh, not unsystemized, disorganized theology. What are the major doctrines in the Bible? Here, here, here they are, seven major doctrinal areas. You talk to different theologians, they will come up with some different categories, but historically, these are some of the major, these are the major areas, right? What does the Bible say about itself? The Word of God. Uh, wh wh what does the Bible say about God? What does the Bible say about man? What does the Bible say about a Christ, Christology? We got special terms for all this stuff. And we'll, we'll expose those too, so. But don't be, don't be, don't be over-impressed. We're just trying to share what the Bible says. Why study theology? Why do this? It's what Christians do. Why study the Bible? It's what we do, right? You see, can Jesus help you 
in your marriage if you accept him as Savior and Lord? Everybody say yeah. Yeah. Can he help you with your addictions if you accept Jesus as Savior and Lord? Absolutely. Can he help you in your work if you accept Jesus as Savior and Lord? Yeah. But not until you know how the gospel does it. I mean, you can know that God is good and God is all-powerful, unless you know the Word of God in its more detailed form, you don't know how He wants to bring about transformation. And the Bible is used to bring a transformation of our mind that transforms our, the affections of our hearts that gets to the decisions that come from our feet. That's the way God normally works. Head, heart, feet. And we live in a very emotional culture that tries to get your affections, your emotions, all worked up. And that ain't going to work. So guys, uh, the bottom line is we need to understand uh, that we study scriptures because those, the theological points, will, in the truths of the Bible transform us. And the more you know the truth, the more you will recognize error the minute you see it. I took a piece of jewelry uh, that somebody gave me, my, my stepmom, my mom, I don't know. I found it the other day. I took it into a jeweler, and I threw it on the couch. I said, is this real or not? He didn't even put a scope on it. He said, that's, that's fake. Why? He was such an expert on the real thing. He could pick out the fake like that. Uh, how do we study the Bible? Throw those up. There it is. That's how. We'll talk more about that as we go. You're a theologian. Talk about it around your table. Do some work, and I'll get you out of here on time. All right, gentlemen. All right. Now, I know, I know there's uh, stuff to talk about, right? So we're beginning Ford Seminary. We're always in seminary. There's always stuff to talk about. Uh, if you have questions from today, and obviously we went fast in a lot of areas, email me at Pete Alwinson at ForgeTruth.com. Pete Alwinson at ForgeTruth.com. Or, and uh, let's, we'll deal with the questions. Uh, we'll also have more time to deal with these things as we go, all right? I want to ask Brandon to come on up here today while I say that the tables have to go down today, okay, guys? I said it. Brandon is with Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Tell us about what you're doing locally. You're the, you're the new director, right? Yes, so area director for East Seminole County, so that's Haggerty, Oviedo, Winter Springs, Lake Howe, and your middle schools, and then I have Masters, Geneva, and I also have uh, St. Luke's, so. Yes. Wow, that's a tough crowd over at yeah. St. Luke's. You I wanna hear, a, so I did some research. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. so I did some research. It's about 18,700 kids. Wow. And you're now the new director. You gave up being a lawyer to do this. I did. I oh, did. Oh, man. Good choice. Good so, choice. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really something that God gave me a passion and a desire to go back and change. So I played professional basketball, and then I went to law school, and I left it all behind to come and impact students and coaches. So our ministry, we work with student athletes and coaches, and our belief is that by using the influence of student athletes and coaches, we can reach the whole campus and we can really make a difference at these schools. Mm -hmm. And so I really just, I mainly just wanted to come introduce myself and tell this vision that I have for, for SCA and what I want to do. And so if that's something that interests you and you'd like to hear more about it, I have a little sign up in the back and, and yeah, so. Sign up on the way out, you'll see, you can't miss this guy here. <laughs> Uh, and so that is so awesome. I'm going to pray for you at the very end, but thank you so much for, yes, for doing this. Thank you. Thanks, All right, Pete. give it up for Grant. <clears throat> so NASA was interviewing people to be sent to Mars for an experiment, 
and only one could go, and he couldn't return to earth. The first applicant was an engineer and was asked how much he wanted to be paid for going. A million dollars, he said, because I want to donate to MIT. The next applicant was a doctor, was asked the same question. He said, two million, I, I want to give money for medical research. The third applicant was a lawyer who wanted three million. And the interviewer said, why do you want so much? He said, well, you give me three million, I'll keep two million and pay the engineer to go. <laughs> Brandon is not that lawyer. But the reality is we live in a broken world and an evil world, don't we? And we live in a world uh, where the, the, the lies infiltr infiltrate the church, where we are surrounded with liars every day. And there's some politicians that you know they're lying because their lips are moving. <laughs> and we've come to see it. Don't be shocked. Um, the reality is we need truth believers and truth tellers. And it's got to be all of us, the church. Um, I like the sign. I said, uh, yeah, it's all of us, all of us. I saw a sign the other day that said this, one day you'll find someone who is obsessed with you it's probably going to be a dog, but it is what it is. Uh, except when it comes to the gospel, God is obsessed with you. God did not take on human flesh and walk among us and go to the cross if he wasn't deeply obsessed with restoring us into a relationship with himself. And he's done that for you. And the tomb is empty, and so is the cross, because the work was finished of redemption. But the work has to continue to spread the great work of redemption to other people. And we have to grow up in the faith, fully mobilized group of people. Truth, truth. Vote today. Vote for the best sinner that connects with biblical truth you can. You're not voting for a pastor an ordained minister of the gospel who is holy and perfect like me. <laughs> right? You vote for the man or woman who upholds the truth of Scripture the best. I just finished rereading this little book, The Master Plan of Evangelism. Robert Coleman wrote it years ago. And, um, and he makes this point at the end of the book. We have not been called to hold the fort, but to storm the heights. We must always remember that the goal of the gospel is world conquest. We're not to hold any ground. We are to be used by the God of the universe for world conquest to the glory of God and the good of people. And that cannot be done unless we know the truth and speak it. Let's pray. Father, what a deep privilege it is to be with these men today, every week. What a deep privilege to know that they're brothers, that we are all believer priests, that, that we are so humbled that you could use us in our place of work, as imperfect as we are, to know the truth, to be set free by it, and to help other people so I pray today, Lord, that not only would you help Brandon and thank you for that call where you yanked him out of those great environments that he was in and brought him here. Thank you for bringing him here to Seminole County. Use him in a big way. All those students that need to know Jesus and how we could maybe help in mentoring them. But Lord, be with all of us today too as we head out into the world that is all around us. Give us a big vision 
And may we understand that as your sons, we can know the truth and be set free by it. So use us in a powerful way. We give you honor and praise as we pray these things in the strong and risen name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's men said, amen. amen. Go get them, guys. Go get them. <laughs>